Okay, so today we go to the next and actually the final imaging modality that we have to discuss, and that is magnetic resonance imaging, um, which is very different from the other ones, and we will see why it's different also, and it's also being used quite a lot, although its availability is a bit less than some of the other uh, imaging modalities. And just to come back to our eggs, so as we said before, so we have discussed the X-ray based, uh, so projection X-ray with a very, very good spatial resolution. CT, uh, where you really can nicely make tomographic slices, but which is looking at atomic concentrations, so which is not uh, able to, for example, discriminate uh, eggs based on how they have been cooking and whether they're still liquid or whether they're hard. Ultrasound, which has an extremely good resolution in the direction of the beam, which is very anisotropic in other directions, but has the advantage or the disadvantage with, when, when looking for eggs is that we cannot penetrate through the shell easily. Uh, so we really have to look at, at peeled eggs in this case. So we can only look at the hard-boiled egg, but then we can see quite a lot of details in the internal structure. Today we will cover these eggs, which is the, based on magnetic resonance. And what you can see already immediately from these images is that here you can see the difference between the different stages of boiled. And so this is the only imaging modality where you can relatively easily see this. And we will see later on that this is actually based on looking at, at the liquid cont contents or like the water content. But what you also immediately see is that, for example, you cannot see the shell anymore. So you don't see whether there's a shell present or not. So what you will see is that with magnetic resonance imaging, hard structures, so really solid structures, we cannot see. Okay. So what is MRI. Um, so it started in the 70s eh, where the first image was uh, being generated and just like the inventor of the CT scanner, the inventor of the MR scanner also got a Nobel Prize for this. So that just indicates already how important these things are. So magnetic resonance imaging, both magnetic resonance imaging and, and that you might know from the lab for example, magnetic resonance spectroscopy is something which is used quite heavily nowadays. And the thing is with magnetic resonance imaging, what is very typical is that it actually, that with a magnetic resonance imaging scanner, you can actually produce very different images. So while with a CT scanner, in principle, you have one type of image, mostly you take one image, while you can do with contrast or without contrast, of course. Huh? You might tweak a little bit with the, the energy that you're using to do it, but in principle, it's like you take one image. Ultrasound also, you take one image, or of course, you can also take Doppler, but we'll see with magnetic resonance, it's like from the same object, you can take very, very different images, which have actually different information content. And so we will see today that there are very uh, important differences, and the ones that are important is what's called T1 and T2, or proton density, and then we can look at diffusion already. So what you can see immediately is already that you see different structures. Eh? So as I said before, the skull actually is black. You don't see that, but you do see the skin and you see the fat around uh, the skin. And then inside you see the brain and you can nicely discriminate, for example, white and gray matter, something that is not possible with a classical CT, which you could do, of course, as I showed you when you do face contrast CT, but that can currently only be done in a synchrotron and cannot be done clinically. But so what is important is that actually a magnetic resonance scanner is a flexible device with which we can produce different types of images. But that also makes it more challenging. Eh? Like while in order to operate a CT scanner, it's uh, reasonably simple. You have just a few settings, which depend maybe on the, on the size and the body weight of the, of the patient and, and the part of it that we want to uh, image. But uh, an, an operator, which is mostly like a radiology technician, doesn't need to put a lot of settings. 
while when you look at an MRI scanner, it's actually more like, like a cockpit that you have because there's a lot of parameters that you have to tune. And so magnetic resonance requires a lot of expertise just to make the images. Okay, now what is it based on? Uh, so as we said before, when you look at, at medical imaging, we have the different medical imaging modalities because they're using very different physical principles in order to make images. Eh? And, and as we said before, for example, the X-ray modalities that we use clinically are looking at the absorption of X-ray photons when they pass through the tissue. Ultrasound images, they require or they look at the reflection of ultrasound waves in tissues by inhomogeneities. And what we're actually doing with magnetic resonance imaging is, as the, the term already says, is we look at magnetic properties uh, of tissue. And the magnetic properties that we're actually looking at is, well, actually, we mainly are looking at hydrogen. And of course, hydrogen, why is hydrogen relevant? Well, because of course, water, as we know, H2O, so water contains a lot of hydrogen, and our soft tissues are have a very, very high water content, and obviously the blood has a high water content. So, so uh, hydrogen is an atom which is abundant in our bodies, eh? so in biological tissues. And that's why we do or whether we use uh, this to look at. There are ways to do magnetic resonance with other uh, atoms, but that's extremely rare. So it's actually not being used too much in clinical practice. So we're going to focus on hydrogen-based, so actually water-based um, imaging. So what you know is like when you look at a hydrogen uh, uh, atom, it contains a proton, it contains an electron, and what you know is that they have some certain spin. So they're actually kind of processing around each other. And since they are charged particles, any charged particle that is moving, whether it's turning around or whether it's moving in space, is actually creating a magnetic field. Yeah, so with motion of a charged particle, there's always a magnetic field that is associated to it. So if we have, for example, this, this hydrogen atom, <coughs> which is turning around, around its, its axis, or which is spinning, it generates a very small, obviously super small, but it does generate one, a, a, a local magnetic field. Now, when we have... A, a tissue, for example, eh? and when we then look at, at, at the full tissue, of course, these um, magnetic fields are oriented in random direction. Eh? So that means that there is no direction in which these hydrogen atoms are, are kind of pointing. That means that, of course, since the, the magnetic field is pointing in the direction of the axis uh, of, of rotation, what happens is that in, in a bulk tissue, under normal circumstances, the overall magnetic field is zero, eh? because we have as many uh, particles which are in one direction and in the other direction, so of course they cancel out. So that's important. Eh? There's very, very few materials which are magnetic by itself. Eh? That's what we know. Only that we have a few permanent magnets, but most materials are not magnetic. And that's the, the reason is because of the fact that, of course, this is a random distribution. Now, everything changes when we put this, these kind of atoms in a magnetic field, so in an external magnetic field. So if we apply a magnetic field in this direction, so in, the direction, in, in a certain direction, so we call this B, which is called the magnetic field, an external magnetic field that we generate, so for example, we take a magnetic coil. Eh? So as you know, magnetic fields, uh, traditional electromagnets are made by having a wire, like a cop copper coil, for example. You create a coil, you then let electricity go through it. And then within this coil, you create a fixed uh, uh, magnetic field. Eh? So this is a way that we can create, for example, a magnetic field. So say that we create an external magnetic field and we put this proton or we put this, this hydrogen uh, atom in this magnetic field. What happens now, it's, it's still rotating, eh? of course, around its axis, but what actually happens is that under a certain axis, it's actually starting to rotate around this magnetic field also. 
pointing predominantly in the direction of this magnetic field. So it's a little bit like this, it's a little bit like a, <coughs> a gyroscope. So you have an internal rotation. Eh? So you have the, 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 the proton or the, 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 so we talk about proton because of course the, the proton is the biggest charged particle of the hydrogen atom. So that's why we mostly talk about protons and we I'll, I'll talk about this uh, uh, further on. So the proton is spinning around its axis. And at the same time, when we apply an external magnetic field, it will spin around the direction of this magnetic field. And so that's what happened. And actually, the frequency of rotation is determined by the strength of this external magnetic field and a material constant, so which is called the gyro magnetic ratio, which is specific for a certain uh, charged particle. And so, for example, what you see is for hydrogen, this is this kind of 40 megahertz or around roughly 40 megahertz per Tesla. And Tesla is the unit to measure magnetic field strength. And just to give you an idea about strengths that we're talking about, so when you look at the Earth magnetic field is in the order of magnitude of micro Tesla. And a typical refrigerator magnet that you have at home, for example, is in the order of mag magnitude of milli Tesla. So these are quite small. Huh? If you have these, like you, you can buy these like super, super strength magnets, huh, which are based, based on, on neodymium. These ones can do around one Tesla. So that's a very huge magnetic field. And many of these, you, you have difficulties to, if you want to pull them apart, I mean, if you just do it, uh, uh, perpendicular, so, so if you try to pull them apart, that's not possible. Right? You really have to glide them and find ways to put a lever in order to do it. So this type of really strong magnetic fields in the order of magnitude of one Tesla, so that's actually what you will see that we will start using in imaging. Very typically is, is one Tesla, three Tesla, up to seven, and this, this is exceptional Tesla. So, so this is the magnetic fields that we're talking about. So these are really, really strong magnetic fields that we're going to use for imaging. And so you will see that uh, when you look at this, these frequencies are in the order of, of frequencies of, of radio frequency. Yeah? When we look at uh, electromagnetic waves of this uh, uh, wavelength, so that is radio frequency. This is important. We come back to that later on why that is important. So keep in mind, eh? so we take a charged particle, we put it in a magnetic field. What happens is that it will orient itself predominantly to this magnetic field, and it will kind of process around this magnetic field with a frequency which is determined by the strength of the magnetic field, as well as the, the, the type of atom that we're talking about. OK, so sorry. Um, So one of the things that, that is important, of course, to, to keep in mind is when we are talking about individual particles, eh, so individual protons in, for example, magnetic fields, we are in the domain of, of the quantum mechanics. Eh, and we, we know that all of these things are quantized. And also what you will see is that there are always two equilibrium positions for this type of particles. And one is where you have the spin up, so where it points in the direction of the field, and one where it's actually upside down. These are two stable positions for this, this case. Now, what you will have is that actually the uh, spin up, so in the direction of the magnetic field, has a slightly lower energy. So although the one pointing down is also a stable position. It actually needs a little bit more energy to get into that position. So that means that we can switch from one position to the other by adding energy or by losing energy. Yeah? So if we have a particle which is pointing up, we then add exactly the amount of quantum energy that is needed in order to flip it. What will happen is that it will flip. And then what can happen is that later on, spontaneously, it it can flip back while releasing again this energy. And you can prove again so that this energy that is needed eh, is related to uh, the, the, the frequency, eh, because as we said before, 
photons have a certain energy which is related to their wavelength. Eh? So we will see that again, this, this, this value comes in here. So if we would use radio waves, eh? so if we would use electromagnetic wa waves which have an energy which is related to this, and we put this electromagnetic waves to this kind of system, what happens is that we actually can use this to transfer energy to this particle so that it starts to flip upside down. So that is the, the basics, the quantum mechanic basics of what we're going to. Now, obviously, we never can work with individual particles. Huh? So what we do is we work with, with um, bulk particles and we work, for example, and in the end, when we do imaging, we're imaging pixels, or because it's an, an inherent 3D technique, we're imaging voxels. Eh? And so we're looking at a piece of tissue. As I told you before, in the order of magnitude of about one millimeter, eh? so millimeter is, is, the, is about the resolution. So you take a piece of tissue of one millimeter, a cube of tissue of one millimeter uh, at all sides, which means it contains an enormous amount of protons. So that means that in the end, we have to look at the bulk behavior. Right? So as I said before, the bulk behavior without any external magnetic field is such that all these protons are oriented in random directions and they can fall out. So the overall magnetic field that they generate is zero. But if we take an external field and we put this little block of tissue, this little cube of tissue we put in here, within this tissue, then the uh, atoms are going to orient themselves. And most are going to be oriented in the direction of the field. And some, if they are slightly higher energy, will be in the direction opposite to the field. Eh? And as a result, because we see that now most of these have an upward direction, of course, when we now sum up all the small magnetic fields that are generated by the photon rotating around its own axis. Eh? So that's the one that generates this little magnetic field. What we see is that we have a resulting magnetization of this tissue. Yeah? So we take a piece of tissue, we put this piece of tissue in an external magnetic field. What happens is because the atoms reorder in this piece of tissue, it becomes a little magnet itself okay, with this value M. So that is important. And keep in mind, we're looking at bulk behavior. Eh? So also when I, when I ask you to explain, for example, how magnetic resonance uh, imaging works, it's good to know that, of course, you have this quantum mechanics that, it, that is going on, but it's the most important is this bulk behavior. So the first thing is piece of tissue in an external magnetic field starts to become a little magnet itself. That's the first thing. Now, because I told you that with using external energy in the form of radio frequency waves, what we can do is within this block of tissue, we can start flipping individual atoms. Yeah? That means that we actually start, we're going to make that more and more of these atoms are starting to go in the other direction. Yeah? And so that means that we can actually change the direction of this overall magnetic field. And that's actually illustrated here. So that's the first basic principle of MRI image. So we take a piece of tissue, we put it in a permanent uh, magnetic field, the protons orient themselves towards this magnetic field, and if we now add radio frequency energy, as you can see here, eh, so we do this kind of uh, an oscillating radio frequency uh, energy with radio frequency uh, uh, wavelengths, what happens is that we start to more and more flip the overall magnetization of this, this magnet. Okay? So the little magnet that was generated by putting this tissue in a large magnetic field, the direction of this magnet, we can start to change by adding external energy. And so if we add external energy, we keep on this, so we, we turn on the radio frequency wave, eh? and then what happens is that with every wavelength of this radio frequency wave, you see that the magnetization turns a little bit, and at the moment that we have turned it 90 degrees, 
then we stop. We take away this radio frequency. And so what we did now is we actually flipped the overall magnetization of this piece of tissue. Yeah, so come back. I have a little piece of tissue. I put it in a permanent magnet, so in a, in a magnetic field. It orients themselves in the direction of the magnetic field and becomes a small magnet. The small magnet, we can change the direction by adding radio frequency energy, and we can add the radio frequency energy so long up to the point that we have actually flipped this magnet 90 degrees. And of course, it keeps on turning around this, this outside magnet. Eh? So, so we have the outside magnetic field. It orients it. It's turning around it. And what happens is that we flip the direction, but it still keeps on turning around this large magnetic field eh? because that we keep on. The big magnetic field B, this is permanent. We're not changing that one. We once put it on or we put the patient or the object in this field and then we leave this on. And what then happens is first we let the, uh, all the protons orient themselves in that direction. It becomes a little magnet itself. And then with radio frequency energy, we can flip the direction of this magnet so that you get this type of rotation, which is predominantly now, if this would be the Z axis and this would be the X, Y axis eh, in 3D, so what happens is from pointing in the z direction first, what we do is we flip this uh, mag little magnet. So we flip the magnetization into the xy plane. So that's the first thing that we do. Yeah, that's very important. Is that clear to everybody? If you have a question, just interrupt me. Yeah? Because these are the basic principles which are very, very important that you understand them. Well, I don't understand uh, how can it flip 90 degrees? Uh, uh, I don't really understand. Yeah. What you do is it's actually, it can turn because of the fact that, that what happens is that at the individual atom level, what you do is you flip more and more atoms. Eh? And when you do this, then the sum of all these atoms are going to change. So at the moment that you have half of these atoms pointing up and half of the atoms pointing down, what you will get is that you will start to get in this 90 degree, in, in, so in this X, Y plane. Okay, okay. No. Yeah, but the, so that is how it really happens. Eh? So by adding energy, you flip more and more protons and then your overall vector is turning like this. The way you have to always keep it in mind, and that is for the further uh, thing, the most important, is that it looks like this is a vector, right? so your magnetization vector. And this vector, while it's turning, you flip it for 90 degrees, and then it starts rotating in this XY plane. Uh, one question, but so, yeah. um, this, this expression that uh, we have uh, commented, the B1, of, depending on time, uh, this uh, cosinus and sinus expression, is it related to a matrix rotation in order to go from the z axis to the y, a uh, two per two matrix, or uh, it has nothing to do with that? Because as as uh, in previous sessions we we saw this kind of uh, matrix rotations, uh, I was I was wondering. No, 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 no. Well, well the thing is, is, yeah, no. No, no, not immediately. The, here, you really have to look at it as vectors. That's the most important. So it's a, it's a vector with a certain magnetic strength that is per, pointing in a certain direction. And it's the direction of this vector that you're changing. What you will see is we will also change the amplitude of the vector. There's different ways to do that because that, that, that is actually important because you're always, what you do is you try to measure and manipulate both the direction of this magnetic vector and its amplitude. That's what it's all based on. Okay, so but the first thing is, yeah, sorry. No, no, keep, keep going. Uh, my question was yeah. if, if the if the axis uh, pointed in white, this uh, this coordinate system remains the same for all the process. We are not changing coordinates. This was my my question. No, okay. no, no, no. We at this moment we're not not changing the coordinate system. No, 
Um, well, depending on if you want to do calculations and things like that, and for reconstructions, it could be that we do that at some point. Eh? But but at this moment, what we're doing at because the, what is important is this the the coordinate system is actually the coordinate system of the scanner. Eh? What oh. you will see later on is is a magnetic resonance scanner is actually a long tube, and the direction of the tube that is this uh, Z component because that's where we create a magnetic field. Okay. So a base magnetic uh, resonance scanner is like one large permanent magnet, yeah? and that magnetic field that's where we put the the patient in. Then within the patient, all the protons of this patient are going to be direct in the direction of this tube, in the direction of this this uh, magnetic field, and that's the z-axis, and that's what we start working with. And so then the first thing that we do is at radio frequency energy so that these uh, little protons which are directed in the in the direction of the of this main magnetic field they can actually flip 90 degrees because one of the problems of course is that if we want to measure this eh, so because in the end you need to do a measurement and the thing is in the direction of this magnetic field there's no way that we can measure things because this magnetic field is very, very strong, and it's it's not possible to put uh, measurement coils there, for example. Right? So what you do is, you know, just like I said, that you can generate a magnetic field with a coil where an electrical current is going through. Mm -hmm. You can measure a magnetic field by the electricity that's induced in a coil by this magnetic field. So we use actually coils in order to measure this. And we can measure in the X, Y axis, eh? because when you see the scanner, the scanner is a tube. We can mount coils at the side of the tube, but we, of course, cannot mount tubes in the direction of the tube. And that's one of the reasons why we flip it. The other reason why we flip it, we will see, is that we need to perturbate from a stable uh, uh, position, because depending on how it goes back to the stable position, that's what we measure. But that will become clear uh, in a minute. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So that's what we do. Eh? So if we if we turn oh, no. on the uh, radio frequency wave for a certain period of time, enough to uh, so that the rotation is ninety degrees. So what we then did is we flipped it for ninety degrees. Of course, if we keep this 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 uh, radio frequency field on. What now happens is it keeps on going further, eh? it keeps on rotating. And if we do it twice as long, what you will see is that we flipped it for 180 degrees. Or this is what we call an inversion pulse. So you will see these are two pulses that come in later on. We will talk about pulse sequences. So a 90 degree pulse flips the, the vector for 90 degree, a 180 degree or inversion pulse will flip it over 180 degrees. And these are the two that are being used. It will become clear later on why these are being used. Okay. So now there is what happens is if so what I told you before is if we put an object in a large magnetic field, what happens is that the protons will direct themselves in that the direction of the field. If we then flip them 90 degrees by adding energy, yeah? so what happens is, of course, then they, they are pointing 90 degrees. But if then we take away that energy source, what happens is that they will return. They want to return back to this position where they point in the direction of this magnetic field. And actually, that what we call relaxation. Relaxation after a 90 degree pulse, that's what we want to study and what we want to measure. Now, there are two main top types of relaxation. And this is where this T2 and this T1 come in. And the first one is called T2 relaxation. And T2 relaxation, what it actually does is, one thing that you have to keep in mind, eh, what I told you before, is the frequency at which this proton is rotating around the magnetic field around the large magnetic field that is determined by the strength of the magnetic field and the property of this atom now the strength of the magnetic field is of course 
determined by this large magnetic field that I'm using. But keep in mind what I told you before is the tissue itself becomes a little magnet. So that means that when I look at a piece of tissue, that piece of tissue will feel the magnetic field which is generated by the surrounding piece of tissue. And if that tissue is not homogeneous, that will mean that it will have a slightly different density and spatial distribution of protons. That means that very locally around the tissue, the magnetic field is slightly modulated by the properties of the tissue that's surrounding it. If we have totally homogeneous tissue, the magnetic field will be exactly the same everywhere. And this frequency at which the, the protons turn around this magnetic field is exactly the same everywhere. And so what happens if we then flip? That means that they keep on rotating in the same direction or together eh, because they rotate at the same speed. Now, if there's a little bit of difference in the local property of the tissue, eh, and that's what we have in, in all uh, uh, biological tissue, what happens now is that actually every individual proton of that tissue feels a very slightly different magnetic field and thus has a very, very slightly different frequency. And that means that actually after a while, eh, so if we flip this vector, this is one vector, eh, because first, Everything is oriented in the direction of this field. We then flip it. What now happens is, of course, they keep on rotating eh, in this the XY field. But because of the fact that all of these feel a, a very, very slightly different magnetic field, they actually are rotating with a slightly different frequency. And so that means that after a while, what happens is that while first they are rotating with exactly the same phase, what happens is that you can see is because some are rotating at a faster speed than the others, what happens is that they are dephasing. Eh? So they will be their position, the position that they're pointing at in the XY plane, that's important, in the XY plane, the position that they're pointing for every single proton is starting to change after a while. And that's what you see here. So what happens is that each of these individual little magnets that make this large magnetization of this bulk of tissue, they are starting to rotate with a different phase and they're kind of spreading out. But of course, what I told you before, the resulting little magnet that this tissue becomes is of course the sum of all the little magnets. If they all point in the same direction, then they all go together and form a certain amount of, of amplitude of this magnetic vector. Of course, when you now flip them and they start to dephase, they become in, in kind of all different uh, uh, angles, eh? so with all different phases. What of course happens now is that the total sum of, and so the amplitude starts to go to zero, eh? because if they're totally dephased, there is no kind of uh, uh, kind of turning together anymore in some ways, what happens is that, of course, the resulting vector becomes zero. So that means that if we flip it, this vector in 90 degrees, and we let it rotate for a little bit in this xy plane, what happens is that the amplitude of the vector in the xy plane starts to become smaller and smaller and smaller and becomes zero at some point. So that's actually what we call T2 relaxation. Eh? So when we look here is, here is the same thing. Eh? So uh, once again, so in the, say that this is the XY plane. After the 90 degree pulse, the vector is in the XY plane and is rotating in this. Now, because all the individual protons that comprise this total vector are starting to rotate with a different phase, what happens is that the resulting vector goes to zero. Okay? So if we have 100% first of the vector that was flipped, after a certain period of time, this becomes zero. The amplitude in the xy plane becomes zero. And the speed at which this uh, uh, kind of decreases, that depends on the tissue. So this is called T2 relaxation. 
and the T2 value of the relaxation is depending on the tissue, which, for example, the T2 of fat is very short. So if it's fat that is being there, what we'll see is that the amplitude reduces enormously quickly eh? because of the fact that fat is, of course, a very complex molecule. Eh? So when you look at fat molecules, these are large molecules. So that means that the hydrogen in there at every position is very different. So that means that every hydrogen almost is spinning at a different uh, uh, speed. So it reduces very, very fastly. While in, in CSF, so cerebrospinal fluid, for example, which is very water-like, you will see that it's very, very slow because here, of course, this is much more homogeneous. And here is also where you see a difference, for example, in the white and the gray matter eh, in this relaxation uh, uh, coefficient, you will see that these are different. So this is important. Eh? So this is the first type of relaxation that we have. It's called T2 or spin-spin relaxation eh? because it's the interaction between the different spins that causes locally slightly different magnetic fields and thus locally slightly different frequencies at which they turn around. And because of these slightly different frequencies, after a while, they start to rotate at a different phase, making that the overall amplitude becomes zero. In the XY plane, eh? so keep in mind, we originally had put a tissue in the magnetic field. It orients by the magnetic field. Then we have put radio frequency waves in order to flip it 90 degrees. And then we let it rotate in this X wave, XY plane, which is the 90 degrees plane. And then we look at what's happening there, and we see that the amplitude of the, the bulk amplitude, eh, so the sum amplitude of the magnetic vector, becomes zero because of the fact that we get dephasing. Is that clear? Because that is a very important concept. OK, now. What I told you before is if I put protons in a large magnetic field, what happens is that these protons will align themselves with this magnetic field. Eh? So that's the first thing that we do. So of course, if we flip it 90 degrees, what will happen is that this vector, all the protons will want to go back to this original state. Eh? Actually, when you look at, at the quantum mechanical way, so all the protons that we had flipped by adding radio frequency energy, what happens is that they slowly will start to flip back because that's a lower energy state. And while flipping back, they will release some energy. So that means that when we look in the XZ of, or the YZ plane, what happens is that we first flip this vector, we stop the radio frequency, and then of course this vector is going to go back up. That's the normal thing that happens. And that is what we call T1 relaxation. So T1 relaxation is going back to the original state after we have flipped it up. So it's going back to the zero degrees while it was first 90 degrees. And we call this spin lattice relaxation eh? because this is related with the fact that each proton kind of loses energy and then goes from the down state to the up state. So T2 relaxation has nothing to do with energy loss. It just has to do with dephasing of the direction, and that's how it becomes smaller. T1 relaxation is energy loss. So the energy that we have added with the uh, radio frequency wave is now being lost to the matrix, to the lattice. So, and then this goes back into the direction of the field. So when we look at T1 relaxation, so what happens is that the longitudinal magnitude, eh, so the Z component, so of the, the original component in the direction of the magnetic field is going from zero when it was flipped. It goes back to its original position, to its 100%. And the speed at which this happens, eh, so that's with T1 as the relaxation constant, this speed, again, is dependent on tissue. Where fat is relatively fast, water, again, is relatively slow. 
Yeah? So we see that this going back in its original state, what you will see is that will depend again on the tissue. So what we have now is we have two types of relaxation that are tissue dependent. Yeah? So that means that we can use this in order to try to figure out which is the tissue that we're looking at by measuring how fast this relaxation is taking place. So that's the whole basic principle of uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So let me summarize once again in another cartoon. Huh? So we put a piece of tissue or the whole body, obviously, when we, when we uh, look at, at uh, um, uh, humans, for example. Huh? So we put it in a magnetic field, which is pointing in the Z direction. Then after a while, which is very rapidly, yeah, so of course, which is again with the order of, of, of seconds. So what happens is that first, all the protons orient themselves in the direction of that field. Now we start to do our measurement. And the first thing of our measurement is we add a radio frequency pulse in order to flip this vector for 90 degrees. Once this is flipped, two uh, things are happening. Two types of relaxation are happening, of course, at the same time. Eh? So one is that in the xy plane, the amplitude of our vector will decrease because of the fact that we get dephasing of the vector, because of the fact that every single proton sees a slightly different uh, environment or magnetic field because it's surrounded by different distributions of other uh, uh, hydrogens or other protons and thus is turning at a very very slightly different frequency and that causes dephasing and if we have total dephasing of course we have a reduction of the amplitude of the whole vector to zero that's t2 relaxation happening in the xy plane no energy loss because of the fact that we have a different uh, rotation frequency because every proton sees a slightly different magnetic field. At the other hand, what we have is that once we flip this vector, that vector wants to go back to the original position determined by the large external field. So it wants to flip back from the 90 degrees. And that happens with a relaxation, which is called the one relaxation that restores the direction of this vector. And if we look at different types of tissue, what we see is we have different combinations of T1 and T2 for different tissue. And this, the fact that these pairs of T1 and T2 are different for different tissues, that's actually what we're going to try to exploit and going to try to measure in order to look at different tissues. And what you see now immediately is that soft tissues, uh, that different soft tissues actually have different combinations of values. And that's why magnetic resonance is very good at looking at soft tissue, because we look at properties which are intrinsically different in the different soft tissues. Is that clear? Do you understand these two types of relaxations? Okay, so what I told you before is the way to measure this now. Eh? So what we do is we measure in the uh, XY field and for that we actually use coils. And so a signal is induced in these coils and we actually use 90 degrees coils. So that's called quadrature coils. The details are not important, but what we measure is we measure the signal which is induced by the rotation of this magnetic field around these coils and of course what we get is we get a sinusoidal electrical signal eh? when you have a magnet that rotates in a coil or around the coil then we get a sinus wave so this is what we measure so we measure sine waves with a certain frequency and a certain amplitude and by doing this in two directions so, so in quadrature we can actually determine where the vector is located at a certain time point. So we can look at its magnitude and its position. That's the basics of the measurement. Okay, now, how will we do imaging? 
Yeah? Because if we do this, if we put this bo the, the whole body in the scanner, all these protons are being directed in the direction of this magnetic field. If we then add a 90 degree pulse, all the protons of the whole body would flip up and we have no idea where we're looking. So we have to find a way so that we can look at a specific slice or a specific piece of tissue, for example. And the way we do that is by using gradients. And the way is, again, being based on the principle that if we add radio frequency in order to do 90 degree uh, pulse, the energy, the wavelength of this radio frequency has to be exactly right for the magnetic field that this proton is in and the constant of the proton. If we use a radio frequency pulse, which is a little bit higher in frequency, nothing will happen. A little bit lower in frequency, nothing will happen. Only at exactly the right frequency, de determined by the magnetic field that the proton is in, it will flip 90 degrees. So, if we now, in the direction of the scanner, eh, in the direction of set, if we would add a gradient magnetic field, so that means that we would locally change the magnetic field. Eh? So we have the magnetic field, which is determined by the um, main magnetic field, eh, which is constant, which is the same for the whole body. But if on top of that, we add a gradient magnetic field, making that at every position, in the tube of the scanner, actually the magnetic field will be slightly different, eh? namely the main magnetic field plus the gradient. And if we change this gradient, we make it uh, dependent on the position. What now happens is that only in one slice in the body, only in one position, using a certain amount of a certain energy of the radio frequency uh, pulse, we can flip for 90 degrees. Yeah. So if we make that in the whole tube, in the whole position, over the whole body, there's only one position that has exactly the right magnetic field for my pulse, then only in that slice will the protons flip 90 degrees. And the slice next to it, the field will be too low. This, the, the kind of at the other side, the field will be too high. And these protons will stay in the direction of the field. They are not changing. Yeah, so by choosing a, the right gradient of this magnetic field together with the right radio frequency pulse, we can actually selectively flip only the protons in a certain plane. And this is what we call slice selection. Yeah, so now instead of flipping the, the, the protons in the whole body, we can flip the protons only in one slice. And of course, if we then do measurements, we know that all the things that we are measuring will only come from this slice because that's the only protons that flipped for 90 degrees. And so that's the way that we do what's called this slice uh, selection by using a extra magnetic field, which is relatively small, of course, in compared to the main magnetic field, but which is dependent on the position. And that's the most important. And the RF pulses, again, we have to select the right frequency for a certain position that we choose. So if we put a body in the scanner, big magnetic field, we add a um, gradient. Then with the lower frequencies of radio frequency, we select one side of the body. If we increase the frequency of the radio frequency pulse, we can select a slice, which is, of course, at a different position. And actually, the nice thing here is that we can do this in any direction. Yeah? So while a CT scanner will always make slices in the direction of the X-ray tube, eh, the X-ray beam, so with a CT scanner, we can only make slices in a certain direction. What we could do is turn, of course, the whole CT scanner in order to make an oblique slice. That is possible, but that's rarely being used. In magnetic resonance, by choosing these gradients well, we can actually choose an arbitrary plane in any direction. And that is, for example, relevant here if we do cardiac imaging, for example, because we know the heart is oriented 
in a position so that it's pointing to the left and pointing to the front. So that means that if we want to make a cut straight through the heart in what we call this kind of four chamber view, we have to have an oblique plane in order to do it. And with a magnetic resonance scanner, by choosing the right gradients in function of space, we can do this. And we can actually select the plane that we would want to look at. So what you can see here is that, of course, one of the things is that this um, gradient in the magnetic field has a certain steepness. And the frequency of the radio frequency pulse actually has a certain bandwidth. Yeah? Because keep in mind, Fourier theory, in order to choose one frequency in the frequency domain, we need a sine wave of indeterminate time in the spatial domain. We cannot do that, of course, eh? because we need to use pulses of a certain duration. We cannot do this forever. And also, especially since we have to do it for short period, that means that by definition, our RF pulse has to be short in the spatial domain, which means that it will broaden in the frequency domain. Eh? So we have a certain bandwidth. So that means that if we use a realistic pulse, a realistic pulse has a certain bandwidth. So that means that it contains radio frequency energy that will, will kind of work for a larger magnetic field range, of course. Eh? And that determines the slice thickness. So the slice thickness, the minimal slice thickness that we can choose will depend on the bandwidth so on the minimal bandwidth that we can get from the radio frequency pulse and this actually fundamentally determines the spatial resolution that we can have and when we look at scanners uh, so realistic scanners are as i said before a very typical magnetic resonance scanner is one and a half uh, sorry is one and a half tesla of main field then the slice thickness will be in the order of magnitude of two millimeters. In scanners, high-end scanners that are being used a lot in clinical practice, especially for neuroimaging and for cardiac imaging, we use three Tesla scanners, and there the minimum thickness of the slice that we can reach is about one meter. We cannot do better because of the technological limitations with the radio frequency pulse that is being used to select this uh, slice of course if we would change the gradient if we would make this steeper eh, that means that the mag magnetic field will, would change faster in space then of course we can again make this smaller eh? but the problem is the steeper you make this first of all making the steeper is is difficult but also making the steep has potentially some safety implications eh? because if we have uh, rapidly changing magnetic fields, and especially since we have to put these gradients uh, fast, we have to switch them on and off for imaging, as we will see later on, that has a safety limit in order not to damage tissue. And that makes that a fundamental limitation of current scanners, and it's very difficult to go beyond that because it's really based by, on the physics, is about one millimeter. So that's important to keep in mind. Okay, now we're gonna start another uh, kind of difficult part, an important part. So I think it's better to take a short break first and then start fresh with the next part. Is there any questions up to now? Is this clear? Do you understand what T2 and T1 relaxation is? And do you understand how we can select a slice by using a magnetic gradient so that we make only parts of the tissue sensitive for a certain radio frequency frequency um, the magnetic gradient uh, changes along the x and y axis or along the z one because if it's the z one i don't understand in the three directions you will see we will see that we will change that in the three directions by changing it in the z direction we can do slice uh, selection by changing it in the x y so actually if you want to do a random oblique plane, of course, you need to do that with a combination of X, Y, and Z gradients. So you have them in all directions, actually. OK. Yeah, uh, Bart, I have uh, another question. 
Um, yeah. But what you say it uh, of the limitation, uh, I didn't quite get it. Mm -hmm. Well, what I told you before is that the slice you select here eh, is by choosing, by making that you first of all change the magnetic strength as a position and the fact that only when you, we use a certain specific frequency of the radio frequency pulse, only those protons that are exactly in the magnetic field that corresponds to that frequency, only these are flipped. Yeah. Yeah. So if we change the magnetic field and we would have an ideal radio frequency pulse of just one frequency, we would have a very, very thin slice where we would flip them. Now, in reality, eh, knowing always this thing is like a small band, so one frequency in the uh, Fourier domain means an infinite length of signal in the uh, spatial domain, and we cannot make infinite length of radio frequency waves. Eh? So we need to make them a finite length. So we can only put the radio frequency on for a certain time period. So that means that when we look at the overall pulse of the radio frequency, it's not an ideal sine wave, but it's actually a sine wave modulated by a window. For example, a sync function, eh? so that you know it's like a sine which becomes bigger and bigger and then smaller again, eh? so that's limited in time. But if we then look at the frequencies that it contains, we see that it doesn't contain one frequency anymore, but it contains a range of frequencies which we call the bandwidth. And of course, since we have a range of frequencies, that means that also a range of magnetic fields will be excited by this frequency. And so even if we have a certain change in the magnetic field, by the fact that we have a range of bandwidth, we see that this whole range of magnetic fields, so that is changing in the z direction, our, our gradient, that means that we will not do an a, a extremely thin slice, but we actually do a thicker slice with a range of magnetic fields which correspond to the range of the radio frequency in the bandwidth of this realistic pulse. So that means that if we put a realistic pulse, we will always excite, so we would do a 90 degree flip in a plane which has actually a certain thickness. A certain thickness which is determined by the bandwidth of the radio frequency. So what is the frequency content? What are the different frequencies that we have in our free radio frequency pulse? And the steepness of the gradient locally. And so the faster the gradient locally, the magnetic field locally is changing, of course, with a certain bandwidth, we will see that we can have a thinner or thicker slice. So and both this bandwidth, we cannot go under a certain limit because that we cannot do because of time constraints and technical constraints. And we cannot go beyond a certain steepness of this gradient, mainly because of, well, combination of safety and technical constraints. And that means that we end up with a, a kind of minimal, the smallest plane that we could ever selectively select of about roughly a millimeter. Wait. Thank you. Now I get it. Okay. So let's come back in 10 minutes.